On the first night of World War II, a German U-boat fires two torpedoes into the passenger liner Athenia, sinking her without warning. 128 men, women and children die in the waters of the frigid North Atlantic, and the British Admiralty, horrified by the implications, rushes to institute an effective system of defence. Winston Churchill, soon to be the Prime Minister of Britain, is a man of great experience. During World War I, he'd been the First Lord of the Admiralty and was keenly aware of Britain's weakness where the U-boat was concerned. In the last year of that war, the Germans disregarded international law by conducting unrestricted submarine warfare, attacking any ship, even neutrals, within Britain's territorial waters without concern for the safety of the merchant crews. If not for the timely defeat of Germany's army on the European mainland, Britain might have been brought to its knees by the German U-boat campaign. Churchill believes that things will be different this time due to a device called sonar. Sonar is a transmitter receiver that sends a highly directional sound wave through the water. If the sound wave strikes a submerged object, it is reflected back and picked up by the receiver. The length of the time from transmission until the echo is received is used to measure the range, which is shown as the flickering light on the range scale. By mounting the transmitter head so that it can be directed like a searchlight, the bearing of the target can be read from the compass receiver. Once located, a ship speeds to the area and drops depth charges on the U-boat, destroying it. However, Karl Dönitz, the head of the Nazi U-boat arm, is a man determined to prove that in the U-boat he has the decisive weapon of the war. As a First World War U-boat commander, Dönitz discovered firsthand that it is extremely difficult to spot the low silhouette of a U-boat attacking on the surface and under the cover of darkness. He had found little difficulty in getting through a convoy's escort screen, sometimes into the convoy itself and calmly torpedoing the merchant ships all around him, then making his escape at speed on the surface. Dönitz intends that the night surface attack, which completely defeats the sonar, will be the ultimate tactic of the coming war. He combines this first principle with a second innovative idea. If, instead of acting alone, several U-boats could be gathered together to make a coordinated attack, then untold destruction could be wrought among the merchant ships of the convoy. He calls it the Rudel tactic or the wolf pack. Dönitz lobbies hard to have as many U-boats as possible in service before hostilities begin. He calculates that he'll need just 300 U-boats to win control of the Atlantic, and is frustrated to discover that the German high command, like the British, does not view the U-boat as a potent weapon. Dönitz resigns himself to the fact that only after successes in war will his strategy be fully appreciated. He continues to train his crews and waits for hostilities to begin. When the shooting does start, Britain finds herself more susceptible to the commerce raiding U-boat than ever. The nation needs to import more than 40 million tons of goods a year. Without the arrival of thousands of these ships over the course of a year, Britain can be starved into surrender. Dönitz is keenly aware of Britain's dependency upon sea trade and intends to use his U-boats to tighten the noose around her neck. The convoy is a strategy for protecting seagoing trade that goes back centuries. It slows the rate of shipping but makes the defence of individual ships more manageable. By collecting together dozens of lightly armed freighters and having them escorted by warships, it is thought that attacking U-boats can be more successfully fought off. For Dönitz, the opening year of the war is a frustrating one. Instead of the requested 300 U-boats, he has only 46 with which to attack the Allies. Long supply lines mean that he frequently has less than a quarter of his U-boats in enemy waters. Still, British losses to the U-boats are considerable in the first year of the war. However, their success is limited to sinking ships sailing independently of convoys and the conditions needed to demonstrate the wolf pack continue to elude the U-boat command. When German panzers roll into Paris in June of 1940, a dramatic effect is felt in the U-boat operations. Dönitz wastes no time in relocating his headquarters to Lorient, France's chief Atlantic port. 
By reducing the distance U-boats need to travel before reaching their operational areas, he effectively doubles the number of boats that can be kept at sea. Dönitz constructs a plan for a new fall offensive. His U-boats are sent to patrol areas far in the mid-Atlantic, beyond the western limit of British air cover. In this new hunting ground, the convoys have only a light escort, and U-boat commanders can operate under the certainty there will be no Allied reconnaissance planes overhead. With all of the elements for the creation of the first wolf pack in place, Dönitz sets his trap. To ensure success, he summons his most reliable commander, Gunther Kryan. At the beginning of the war, fearing that the U-boat arm would be marginalized within the German military machine, Dönitz had called upon Kryan to undertake a dangerous mission. Kryan hits the British where they feel most secure. Scarpa Flow is Britain's main naval base in northern Scotland, heavily defended with a complex series of submarine nets, mines, and a formidable fleet of battleships. Kryan evades all of these, steals into the heart of the defences, and fires a full salvo of torpedoes into the battleship HMS Royal Oak, which blows up and sinks with more than 800 of her crew. Kryan beards the lion in its own den and causes a sensation in both Britain and Germany. Upon his return, he is celebrated as a hero and is awarded the Iron Cross for his actions. Dönitz uses the success to forward his U-boat agenda with his superiors, hoping that the construction of new boats will be hastened. Meanwhile, the Allies have patched together a system of convoy routing and defense that spans the trip between North America and Europe. But with resources stretched to the limit, there are plenty of gaps. Convoys coming from North America sail from Halifax, Sydney, or Bermuda, with an escort of naval vessels made up of whatever the Allies can scrape together, as well as Sunderland flying boats and a motley collection of hurriedly armed passenger ships. At this early stage of the war, most convoys must undertake the mid-Atlantic leg either unescorted or in the company of a single armed merchant cruiser. Upon leaving their original charge, the escorts meet up with another convoy going in the opposite direction. However, weather and logistical errors mean that convoys are frequently left with no escort protection during the dangerous central leg of the trip. The Allies' problems are further compounded by a lack of long-range air support that leaves a gap just south of Greenland that comes to be known as the Black Pit. It is here that the first wolf pack will strike. In August of 1940, the 10,000-ton British-owned oil tanker Frederick S. Fales lays at anchor in the Bedford Basin of Halifax Harbour. Word went out that the Fales was in need of qualified seamen. Yeah, I have someone leave from another ship. I was only home about a week on the back of the city again. I was with the intention of joining the Navy. I asked them if they knew any ships of Merchant Navy, and they said, yeah, there was one looking for men now down the ferry wharf. So I went down there, and, and sure enough, they were one of the able seamen. So I uh, signed on right there and then. She was, a, she was the largest ship they had in the Navy, in the fastest one, or in the Winter Navy. The tanker sits in Bedford Basin for more than a week as ships from all over the eastern seaboard gather. When all of the elements assemble, the convoy contains 42 vessels of five different nations, carrying a quarter of a million tons of goods. Acting as shepherd to this motley flock is HMS Jervis Bay, a converted passenger ship of the Donaldson Line, which had been taken over by the Admiralty just prior to hostilities and fitted with weapons. These armed merchant cruisers are not meant as anything but a short-term emergency measure, a fact that is obvious by Jervis Bay's Victorian-era deck guns and lack of armour. As Ashley Morris makes his way across the Atlantic, the Nazi Air Force is launching nightly air raids on London. To make these bombing attacks more effective, Dönitz posts several boats, Kryans included, far out into the Atlantic to report on weather conditions. Kryan had expended all of his torpedoes in an earlier attack. Dönitz suspects that the British convoy route passes right over the position he has ordered Kryan to patrol. 
The U-boat commander zigzags across his assigned area, dutifully reporting the weather. On the morning of September the 20th, after more than a week of empty seas and grey skies, Brian's hydrophone operator reports a contact. The captain immediately orders U-47 to the surface to investigate. There on the horizon are 42 heavily laden merchant ships sailing for the besieged Britain. Convoy HX-72 has sailed into the first wolf pack's hunting ground. Brian radios Dernitz at U-boat headquarters that he is now shadowing a large convoy on a slow easterly course. According to a well-rehearsed strategy, Brian, as the first boat on the scene, doesn't close to attack, but rather takes up position just over the horizon and follows from the rear. His job is to maintain contact with the convoy and provide constant updates on its position and heading. At U-boat headquarters in France, Dernitz is elated. For the first time, a convoy has been spotted far enough to the west that U-boats from an area extending over 400 nautical miles can be brought to the attack. Among those close enough to catch HX-72 are two of the U-boat arms most dangerous, Otto Kretschmer in U-99 and Joachim Shepke in U-100. These wolves will have two full nights to assault the convoy before it reaches the safety of air cover. Headquarters staff quickly calculate interception courses for the U-boats in the vicinity. Kretschmer, who is closest to convoy, wastes no time and rushes to Brian's call at collision speed. Unavoidable delays have put the convoy behind schedule and now it will have to continue on alone for almost 24 hours before meeting its British escort. The merchantmen will be left to defend themselves, a task for which they are completely unprepared. We're up there doing a gun drill. The gun was a telephone pole with tripods. We were painting it and looking at it. They were looking busy up there. I knew that they were carrying telephone poles. All the freighters were. So I knew you we had nothing to fire with, not nothing to shoot with. Kretschmer sights the convoy just after midnight in the dark hours of the morning of the 21st, after emerging from a rain squall. He begins searching for the most valuable target. The Inver Shannon, a 9,000 ton tanker, is sailing at the tail end of the port column and is badly exposed. Beside the officers on duty, a gunner is posted at the 4.7 inch gun aft. Despite the extra lookout, nothing unusual is spotted. At 11.40 p.m., a torpedo, which seems to come from nowhere, strikes well forward on the port side. A loud crack booms through the hull as a towering column of water erupted alongside. The empty hold floods and the ship begins to sink by the head. Panic breaks out among the crew, and while searching the ship to ensure that everybody has made it to the boats, the master fails to send off an SOS or fire distress rockets. HX-72 has lost its first ship, and the rest of the convoy sails on, oblivious to the threat. Don't forget that convoy was about five or six miles long. Well, eight or nine o'clock, it was pitch black. You couldn't see anything, but you see the silhouette of the ship on the horizon. It was cold up there, so they said, well, you can turn to for a few minutes and get down and have a cup of coffee. Kretschmer doesn't linger to savor his first kill. He makes his way behind the convoy so he can attack from the moonless starboard side. As he crosses through the wake of the convoy, he sets his sights on the rear ship of the outer column and slowly creeps to within 500 meters before firing a single electric torpedo. It runs true and strikes the Baron Blytheswood, a British registered freighter loaded with iron ore, dead center on the starboard side, instantly breaking her back. Kretschmer and his officers, standing on the conning tower of U-99, are astonished as the doomed ship folds in half and sinks beneath the waters of the icy North Atlantic in just 40 seconds. It was obvious there would be no survivors. Everybody feared it was going to go, just hoping it wasn't us, that's all. There's, uh, I don't know, half a dozen, maybe a dozen ships flew up that night. We could see them going. 
we were up in deck all night. Within a half hour, Kretschmer is in a position to fire again. Dedicated to his one torpedo, one ship rule, he closes to under a thousand meters and fires a single torpedo. Once again, his aim is impeccable. The torpedo explodes against his victim amidships. Where's another one going up? And I saw another one going up. There was only about two or three minutes between each one, maybe five minutes. Yeah, we knew the submarine was there, but we couldn't see it. An explosion roars through the ship. Kretschmer has his crew open fire with the 88 millimeter deck gun. Despite being badly holed and flooding, she's still floating on her cargo of redwood lumber. And so with regret, Kretschmer uses his last torpedo to send her to the bottom. With his ammunition expended, he turns his boat away from the convoy and heads for Lorient. He claimed three victims and had successfully used Dernit's night surface attack to deadly effect. For the survivors of Kretschmer's run, the coming dawn means an end to the assault and the much-anticipated rendezvous with their British escort. The merchant seamen are confident that the ships of His Majesty's Royal Navy will give the wolves a fight. But both the convoy and the escort will still have to spend a long, dark night with the most determined wolf of them all. Joachim Shepke, the U-100, is moving into position and preparing for darkness to fall. Brian, in U-48, is still shadowing the convoy when at midday one of his lookouts sounds the alarm. Out of a dark rain squall, two escorts come charging straight for them. Prion wastes no time ordering a crash dive. Wait the shock of the depth charges, but they never come. The escorts have failed to spot them. The escort commander operates under the assumption that a U-boat would never dare to penetrate inside the convoy, because even the light armament of a merchant ship can disable it. He positions his escorts in a loose perimeter around the convoy and issues orders that in the event of an attack, those ship on the engaged side are to immediately search outward with their sonars at a 45 degree angle from the convoy and fire illuminating rockets called star shell to expose the attacker. Star shell shooting up. If another ship gets too close to one or they think it's a submarine, they fire a shell up in the air and it's a bright light. It's up, it's just a ball of light is up. And then it explodes and gets down. It's, you can see the whole convoy. When darkness falls, Shepke inches toward the starboard column of the convoy, still on the surface, and keeping a keen eye for escorts. He increases speed until he reaches a position just ahead of the convoy and unleashes a volley of three torpedoes. Shepke's torpedoes have struck the second ships in columns four, five, and six. Oh my God, he says that thing is a little TNT or dynamite or something. But we watched her come down. We carried on just the same. Another five minutes, another ship went up. Three ships being hit in such a quick succession is too much for some of the merchant captains to take, and discipline begins to break down. We got orders to scramble. That means leave the convoy and get going. Save yourself. Empire Airmen, an ore carrier from Wales, tries to abandon the convoy. And as she turns to the south, she crosses the bow of U-100. Shepke fires at a range of a thousand meters and the ship sinks quickly. The formation now splits in two as the faster ships leading the convoy work up a full head of steam in an effort to clear the area. Leaving the slower ships behind doesn't prove to be of much value. Shepke simply sails through the gap he's blown in the forward group and takes up a position in the convoy as his crew works to reload the torpedo tubes. Running out of torpedoes and with the convoy scattering, Shepke now has to pick his targets carefully. Yeah. Some say we're going to get it. Another person said, no, no, you're not going to get it. We're too fast and whatnot. We just take it out on one set of steps and go in the coffee room. 
and uh, we had the coffee again, poured out. I just started drink wine and bang, something hit the ship. And the lights went out. One went in the engine room. Nobody wants to be in the engine room, I guess. So when they hit the boiler, they blow off and it's boiling water. And they, they're not drowned, they're boiled to death. And before we get ourselves straightened away, there was another bang. And uh, it was a torpedo, and, and we couldn't get the door open. It was pitch black in there. So we pulled and pulled and pulled on the door. We couldn't get it open. So somebody outside must have helped us push it in. And when it comes, that's the only time I was ever scared, I think. But now I figured I was going to drown right in that hole. There, and the blood was running everywhere. They said, abandoned ship, abandoned ship. So that's what we done, abandoned ship. And nobody could swim as fast as I could, I'll tell you that. I swam a boat. I'll bet you I swam a good half a mile. I knew if I had a handy round, it was sinking, you'd get down. You'd get down with her. And while I was swimming, I had to repair a hip rubber boots on. I had to take them off. Couldn't swim with them on. So I was in my sock feet. As Ashley Morris and his fellow crewmen struggle for their lives, Shepke, his torpedoes exhausted, clears the area, easily avoiding the escort that are frantically searching for him. The next day will bring the convoy within the defensive patrols of the RAF, so all U-boats disengage and head for a triumphant return to Lorient. Never had the horn, said, sorry boys, we'll have to leave here, can't, can't pick you up. They took off again, it was only gone about half an hour and they come back with a scramble net over the side. They come up alongside of us, and I was the last one holding on to the rope, so I was the last one to go up the scramble net, get up on the deck. Of course, I couldn't stand up up there. It was cold as oil. And every nationality in the world was on it, I think. Germans and Italians and French and German and everything else. And they give each one a drink of rum. So that felt better. Yeah. While the dawn brings an end to the assault, it also brings Commander Knapp face to face with his failure to defend HX-72. All around is the floating wreckage of Shepke's victims. Knapp and his escort force go to work retrieving the crews of the merchant ships from lifeboats and the oily sea itself. All told, the convoy loses 11 ships, more than 93,000 tons of precious war materials and the lives of 116 allied merchant seamen. Not even a single hit is registered against the U-boats. For the Allies, whose cities are burning and people living in constant fear of invasion, the only thing preventing total defeat is a thin lifeline of steel gray ships. Ashley Morris makes himself a promise. Next time he encounters a U-boat, he'll have more than a wooden deck gun with which to avenge the death of his friends.